Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Mailbag. I'm Dennis Den. I'm filling in for John Campia. He's up in the north somewhere up there with the poo team. Canada. Hockey or He's something like that. He's with the like poo team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, awesome. I'm joined by a panel today. I'm doing a mailbag a little different if you saw yesterday's show. I have a little panel here. I'm joined by Roth Cornett of HitFix. Hello. Good to be here. Thank you. And uh, David Griffin. Always happy to be here. It's my second mailbag yeah. this weekend. And apparently you and me don't like to shower, right? Well, clothes, it's expensive now. I got to yeah. watch my budget. I can't be buying new shirts every day. Or it's I expensive. like this shirt so much, I just had to wear it three days. In yeah. A row. Also, we're in a drought. Yeah. yeah, we're in a drought. Yeah, we can't wash clothes. It's yeah. illegal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, just a reminder, this is the show where we answer your viewer-submitted questions. You can send us an email at collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll answer them here on uh, this show on the weekend or on our movie uh, talk show. Uh, the first question comes to us from Ruben. Hello, guys at Collider. Do you think we will ever get an original movie franchise, not based on any kind of book, reboot, sequel, ripoff, slash, etc.? With the popularity as Star, with the po same popularity as Star Wars or the MCU. Thanks, and enter cliche ending here. David, uh, are we going to see uh, any original franchises being created? I think it's very possible, but difficult. You know, we did uh, you know, a few days back. We did our. Uh, a movie talk episode where we're talking about Sony looking in the well, looking at possibly talking about doing another Men in Black series. Not only a Men in Black movie, but a Men in Black trilogy, mm -hmm. possibly without Will Smith. So they're just digging for old stuff that worked in the past. I would love, though, to see a new idea. I thought when District 9 came out that maybe even though I thought maybe that could be a new franchise. I don't know if it's going to be as popular as a Harry Potter mm. or a Star Wars, something like that. But I thought maybe that could be a new franchise. I think it's possible, but it's hard because people, the studios want to go with what's safe. Mm -hmm. Roth? Well, to be fair, if we're thinking about the last like 10 minutes, 10 minutes, why did I say 10 minutes, 10 years or so, um, if you think about things like the Furious franchise, that mm -hmm. was an original franchise, um, if you, although that's probably more than 10 years at this point, right? When did Since the first, first started, it was 90 something, yeah. Yeah. So that franchise, there's also Paranormal. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity in, um, and Furious 7 made a billion dollars. Um, paranormal activity, and like there's there's room in sort of horror franchises right now to, to create original franchises. And Star Wars, though it is the most successful original franchise ever made, mm -hmm. um, was still hearkening back to those old sort of sci-fi mm. serials. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I hope so. I loved Edge of Tomorrow, which yeah. which then, um, although that wasn't original, was it? It was a graphic it was, novel. Yeah. It was a graphic yeah. novel. Yeah. Damn it. Yeah. It's so hard. That's the thing. It's so hard. <laughs> yeah, I think it's tough because uh, the studios do want to play it safe. They want to take something. Think about all the big franchises nowadays. It's Hunger Games, mm -hmm. Harry Potter, uh, even ones that aren't even aren't even as successful as those. You'd like a Divergent Maze or Runner. Maze Runner. Mm -hmm. all the, everything's based on a book or a comic book like the MCU. He mentions the MCU is based on previous property. Only Star Wars uh, is the original right. franchise creation. I, I think it's tougher and tougher because no one want, no studio wants to take that chance. They want an uh, installed audience from the beginning. They want someone already being cheerleaders for the property even before it starts right because i think though even if we remember I mean, it, it's as more and more money is spent on these mm -hmm. movies and I, I think this is the reason that you're able to do it in horror because you get those micro budget horror movies that can then blow up and be huge franchises and fast and furious when it came out was not that expensive as compared to sort of like a big x-men movie or something like that um they just need to guarantee a return because they're spending so much money on it and we don't like it nobody likes it you want to see something original but it, what it means is that as an audience when something original comes out you have to go see it mm -hmm. i mean remember star wars was privately funded i mean he he yeah. produced it himself that's why he owned the everything most successful indie movie that's of why all time. he yeah. is it's the most successful indie movie of all time and no one knew star wars was going to be star wars no, even george that's why lucas they wouldn't pay didn't for know it. star wars was going to be star wars that's why and they, so the way they pay make because sci-fi is my favorite genre and the way they make sci-fi is different than they did back then they're using less model source jj is kind of going back to seem like he's doing some more old school style of filmmaking but now everybody expects all these big special effects mm -hmm. so i don't know like a movie like alien that came out back in the late 70s i don't know if somebody a studio would finance that or now. terminator i mean yeah. terminator was mm -hmm. independent too and you know 
a relatively low budget for oh, the yeah, time. Oh, yeah, for the first movie? Yeah, for yeah, the first movie. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, I don't know. Will there be? Yes, there will be in the future. I don't know on that level of Star Wars because that's, that's the highest of the highs. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could see some sort of new franchise that comes out that's totally original, only based in movies that, that gets to a certain height. Right. You know, like that, that people are big fans of. But yeah. for now, yeah, it's, it's. For now, we have Star Wars, though. Yes, we still it's have back. Star Wars. Well, never left, but no. <laughs> never. <laughs> All right, on to the next question. We've got Jim McCann, and he writes Hi, Collider Movie Crew. Love the show. In the recent episodes, you've brought up uh, up that a lot, if not all, have The Revenant as one of your most anticipated movies. I was just wondering why. It's not just you, but it's a lot of casual movie fans as well. Don't get me wrong, I am extremely excited for it too. However, even though Birdman was critically received very well, and won Best Picture. It wasn't exactly a big event film, and it seemed like casual movie fans were split down the middle on it. Admittedly, the trailer for The Revenant was pretty sweet, but I couldn't call uh, Alejandro G. Inuratu a household name exactly, and I heard there were a lot of production issues with safety. So where's all the hype coming from? Is Leo really that big of a draw? Thanks, and I and I love all the new shows and the hosts are turning out. Keep bringing the filthy. So, Roth, what do you think of uh, his suggestion that that The Revenant is getting a lot of buzz, even from the casual movie-going audience? And, and why is that? Um, I'm so lost in thinking about what the filthy might have been. Mm-hmm. So give me a moment. Okay. Um, what is the filthy? That's can you something, t- like, can you just- something John <laughs> said and ended up being coined <laughs> as a Oh, phrase. okay. All right. Got it. I'm like, can someone tweet that yeah. and tell me what the filthy is? Um Anyway, sorry. Yes, The Revenant. Well, I don't know. It's hard for me to say what the casual movie goer or Mm -hmm. fan actually likes. My brother is my touchstone for that because he like never knows about anything. He doesn't know that The Martian is coming out. He didn't know that Ant-Man was coming out a week before Mm -hmm. it came out. So I wonder if really, truly casual movie fans, because I feel like you sound like a big movie lover to me. That's what it sounds like to me. And I bet your friends are too. So I bet if they're excited about it, they're maybe not the totally casual movie fan. Having said that, I am excited because of Birdman. And I am excited because I've heard great things about the movie. Um, And I do think Leo is that big a draw. I think he he really, he still has star power in the sense of people, butts will go into the seats just to see him. Yeah, definitely. And I agree with you though. I am wondering, I think maybe your friends are not as casual fans as you think because yeah i use like either my sister or my best friend as to ask them because yeah. they really are not in touch with anything that isn't mainstream so they may have even heard that birdman won oscar but they probably haven't seen it you know right. and the revenant as well I, i'm sure if i ask them about the revenant they're gonna be like what yeah and you know you're like oh you know Deca- well first of all if you said uh, it's a new Inuratu movie. They'd be like, who? who? Who's it? Yeah. yeah. Then if I said Leonardo DiCaprio, okay. Then, <laughs> you know, and then I throw Tom Hardy's name in there, okay. I don't even know about Hardy. Let's, I think we should start a game called Let's Ask Our Siblings. Yes. And like, we just call them on a conference call once a week and ask them about the movie news and see if they have any understanding of any of it. I yeah, Hardy's it. not as huge a name as, as like yeah. a DiCaprio. I think that if you're, I think that if you're watching this show and writing into the show, you're probably pretty passionate about film. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And you're really into it. And probably the people that you're surrounded by are too. That's just a guess because I seriously doubt that that my brother has a single clue. Yeah, there's, a, there's a casual is. movie goer. You see them when you go to the theater. Yeah. yeah. Usually the people, it could be really any age. I want to say probably 30 and up, but you'll see them there looking at the big board and be like, what, what should, should we, we see? go see? That's the casual movie goer. They're not, you know, going on, you know, Collider or HitFix or or any of these other websites and looking at the news and breaking it down and like looking at casting information and who's directing what and what has in your done before this. You know, they're just kind of maybe somebody's told them through word of mouth. So I think Revenant is not going to have a huge opening weekend. Mm-hmm. It's not going to make, you know, mm-hmm. record breaking numbers. But maybe like Birdman, if word of mouth gets around, you'll have that casual movie goer be like, you know what? I was watching the Today Show today and they talked about this new movie with DiCaprio. Mm-hmm. He was on being interviewed and it looked like an interesting movie. Let's go see. It. I think that's the casual movie. Goer. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> DiCaprio has ha- does have that kind of ability mm-hmm. that he'll go on like one of the nighttime shows and then people go, oh, I wonder what that new DiCaprio movie. I like him. I mean, it, it's it, it is. I think most people go to movies twice a year. 
I mean, that's the yeah. the majority yeah. of people. And then you, when you're going like once a month, you're considered a real movie fanatic. So people like us are actually, I think, certifiably insane. Yeah. <laughs> you see like six movies a week. You know? yeah. And on a side tangent, but kind of related um, about the casual movie fan, uh, you know, they just announced the whole alien... Mm-hmm. Uh, Promethei? Lo- uh, yeah, Lost Paradise, right? Yes. This, it's basically Prometheus Part 2, and they title it, even though Ridley Scott kept saying, no, 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 we're not going to bring aliens into it until later on. The reason why they did that is because they need that name recognition because most casual fans, like when Prometheus came out, I asked them, oh, Prometheus, uh, oh, what's that about? Oh, it's, it's about, you know, it's kind of like a prequel to, to Alien. Really? Yeah. That's the first thing they say is, yeah. really? Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that because there's it's not in the name. They have no clue. So I just feel like... Yeah. I think they also want to cleanse the palate from from Prometheus a little bit too. Mm-hmm. They're like, yeah, 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 it's kind of a sequel, but mm-hmm. let's, let's but uh, about but that. he is right. The the, the trailer <laughs> for the Revenant is pretty pretty sweet. With it's the, awesome. The cinematography by mm-hmm. Lubetsky, fantastic looking. I hope a lot of people go see it. I just I'm not sure. Maybe that buzz that you're you're sensing is more amongst people who are a little more hardcore than you think they are in terms no. of uh, movie fans. Yeah. All right, on to the next question. We've got Harry writes, Hey guys, a big fan of the show. As we all know, opinions on movies can vary a lot from person to person. I was wondering, what would you consider to be the most overrated and underrated movies you have ever seen? For me, the most overrated is Lord of the Rings, all of them. And underrated would be Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. Would love to hear what your th- yours are. David? Uh, overrated for me, the more I watch is probably Avatar. I don't think Avatar holds up as well. Because I think when it came out, it did you know, critically people mm-hmm. praise it. You know, it was like this visual marvel. It wasn't like, you know, I mean, it was up for Best Picture that year. I think that, I want to say that was the first year where they introduced the uh, 10 films could be nominated for Best Picture, if I remember correctly. And I, and the theater was amazing, but I got home, watched it a few more times. And I think it kind of loses its power. It doesn't stick with me like James Cameron's The Abyss mm-hmm. or Aliens or, of course, you know, Terminator. It just doesn't stick with me anymore. So I, for me, I would consider that to be a little overrated, even though I don't want to say it's a bad film. Mm-hmm. For me, it was just I thought uh, it was a little overrated. Uh, underrated, I really enjoy uh, uh, the Fast and Furious films. Uh, for me, I mean, I think a lot of people do, but I mean, critically, I think people are going to be kind of afraid to be like, oh, this is a, a great movie, but it's just, it just does action well. It knows exactly what it mm-hmm. is. And I think some movies try to be, <clears throat> Transformer series, <laughs> try to be so much more, not like there's some big, you know, epic opera, uh, and Fast and Furious knows exactly what it is and knows exactly what it does well. And I, that's why I, every time I go see one, I enjoy them. Mm-hmm. They're just always consistent. Mm-hmm. Roth, what are your most overrated, underrated movies? I, I think I gave like Fast 7. I think I gave it like an 8.5 or something. I, I love it. That's great. <laughs> score. That's great score, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think you're right. It, it, it's, it succeeds because it knows what it is. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Distracted. You know, I thought about this and I it's weird. I can't, I'm not trying to get out of it, but I'm going to get out of it because I can't really answer it in the sense of like, overrated and underrated i don't know i i feel like there's things that people like that i don't connect to as much but who am i to say that it's overrated it just means you liked it and i didn't like it as much you know Mm. um but i will say this there's a film that i really like that a lot of people haven't seen and and definitely the critics i don't think cared for which is strange days that's sort of one of those movies that i love that almost nobody does that's the Catherine bigelow Um, movie yeah it's a uh, raf ray fines exactly it's got um katherine bigelow Bigelow directed it, um, who obviously directed Hurt Locker, but also Point Break, which Fast and Furious was drawing from. Okay, damn it. Um, I'm just undercutting my original movies arguments all over the place. (laughs) But it's it's a futuristic sci-fi movie um, in which people are sort of addicted to these virtual reality. It's basically like a version of um, of uh, Oculus, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you could totally see it happening. So it's kind of, um, what is it? The, the cartoon, Wally. It's a little bit mm-hmm. like those people. Anyway, it's really cool. It's got a murder mystery in it. It's hitting on topical kind of social issues. Ray Fiennes is in it. Angela Bassett is in it. It's such a cool sci-fi movie. Nobody likes it. I love <laughs> it. Give it a shot. Uh, I probably have to rewatch that. I remember I saw it, but it was, I think, I, um, either as in high school or maybe early college when I saw it, uh, James Cameron wrote the script mm-hmm. for it. I think he also helped produce it. 
it almost had a little Blade Runner esque feel to mm-hmm. it as well. Uh, for me, overrated, underrated. Well, I can't believe he called Lord of the Rings overrated. Uh, and Star Wars <laughs> underrated. I actually think Revenge of the Sith. Even though a lot of people don't like the prequels, I still think it's overrated because everyone keeps pointing to it going, well, that one wasn't that bad. No, it was that bad. You're just kidding yourself. Um, (laughs) Overrated, I'd have to say. And overrated doesn't mean you don't like it. You just Mm -hmm. don't think it's as good as everyone else. Like, I like uh, Avatar, so I don't think it's overrated. Mm -hmm. Uh, Overrated, I would say Crash. It won the Academy Award. (gasps) It was a movie I felt that was... A lot of critics jumped on, yeah. Mm. A lot of... I just felt it wasn't subtle at, at all. Mm. It just hits you over the head. And yeah, so I thought that was over... Underrated, a lot of movies like uh, Moon, mm. Sunshine. Uh, when you talk about uh, just pure action movies, mm. The Rundown mm. by Peter Berg and The Rock is in it. That was the movie that I was like, The Rock is the next action star. But then he ended up getting to that deal with Disney. He ended up doing mm. like the... The like the hockey kids movie and the football, the football kid, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, like and I, it just spun. I was like, oh, that's it. It's over for you, Rock. But then he, after that was done, he came back and he started getting into all these action movies. I'm like, okay, that's the Rock that I that I saw in the Rundown, which mm-hmm. I think is actually one of my favorite action movies that nobody has seen. There's even a scene with Arnold Schwarzenegger that it, it's a cameo he in just the club. Walks by, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. walks by and just yeah. says uh, I forgot the exact words good luck or something good like luck that, or yeah. have fun or something mm-hmm. like that and it, to me that was like the passing of the torch to The Rock and, mm-hmm. and now we see The Rock as a huge huge action star So and possibly the most charming man who's ever been born Paul Haggis who directed and wrote R- Crash, Crash um, in an interview uh, this is going to sound like a plug for HitFix but I'm sorry it, mm-hmm. it really is like mm-hmm. just top, with Alan Sepinwall who's my colleague mm-hmm. said that he didn't think it should have won an Academy Award mm-hmm. like last month so he agrees with you. That's <laughs> that yeah, that's a little crazy wow. when, when you're like, oh, I won an Oscar, but it wasn't didn't even deserve it. I didn't, <laughs> didn't think deserve so, it. Think so, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, on to the next question. We've got Langley M. Neely writes. So I was watching the wonderful Lake Bell directed film In a World, a comedy about the film trailer voiceover community in Hollywood, and I realized that on the whole. Most trailers today have little to no voiceover narration. You no longer hear the term in a world or a narrated list of actors and directors' names. Most of the narrative work in trailers is done by film clips, reading on screen titles. I was wondering exactly when this change happened and why. Is it to make marketing in foreign markets easier? Is that old school Don LaFontaine deep pitch delivery dated? I'd love to hear your thoughts. David, what do you think? Uh... I always think the sad thing is a lot of voiceover work now is those guys like LaFontaine are you're getting celebrities now as mm-hmm. opposed to I mean LaFontaine when he was alive you know I mean was I guess considered a celebrity in his own right in terms of the voiceover community but it's all celebrities now you hear like the Mercedes as John Hamm and Queen Latifah I mean great for them for making extra buck but that used to be a whole community in and of itself mm-hmm. there used to be a lot more jobs for I guess let's say the not so privileged actors uh, out there who don't make you know millions of dollars a year and it's kind of said that that's going away Imaging wise, yeah, I would say it's just I would think I would think financial. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to pay those people to do those voiceover work. So if you don't have to do it, you can just have somebody edit the trailer and just show images. Sometimes they show too many images. It's probably better for them. So I would imagine it cuts the budget cost. Um, I agree with you that it's sad that that community has gone mm. away. Um, it's it's it started with the stunt casting <coughs> of Robin Williams, I believe, in Aladdin, which was awesome. Mm. But then mm. after that, they kept hiring celebrities for. Although I'm not sure about commercials because I think celebrities did voiceover mm. commercials mm. before that. Mm. But anyway, with movies, um, I believe that's when that really started that trend. I think it's foreign markets really? more. Yeah, I really do. I think it's actually tell the story with the visuals and appeal more to the foreign markets and dub over the dialogue. I, that's my guess. I don't know. But <laughs> that would be my guess as we, we become more and more, you know, things are opening all over the world at the same time more and more. Uh, for me, I think it's actually, it, it's become dated. I mm-hmm. think it's gone out of fashion. I think before we were so used to that in a world or to this voiceover narration during trailers. It's so hard not to say it, isn't and, it? And, and now it's gone into more, okay, that's kind of a little cheesy. Mm-hmm. And so the only time I hear it now in trailers is in comedies. when they kind of Yeah, when they want to play it up. They want to play up like, this is going to be serious. We're taking ourselves <laughs> too seriously. Therefore, it's actually a comedy. Yeah. So I don't, I don't see like imagine like, what's it like the Revenant, right? Yeah. 
We just talked about that movie. Imagine if Don LaFontaine or someone else did a voiceover for that. It would. I, I just don't think it fits anymore. Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm going to start recutting all of the current trailers with an In, the, in a World yeah. voiceover. <laughs> that's that's going to be how I'm going to make my internet millions. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that actually that's a great argument. But also things are released online now, right? Mm. Like So it, it is all mm. re- released all over the world kind of at once. I don't even know why you do different trailers you know whenever we get the trailer it's like oh this is the trailer from from korea and it's like and i have it too in the mm-hmm. u.s like why are we doing different trailers? i mean i guess and there's like, always you have like have the subtitles in no that and there's always like two shots different two shots different yeah, yeah. and trailers just come at you now like you know we're on you're on collider you're on hit fix you click on an article all of a sudden like the martian trailer just kind of you see it there's no sounds there's usually a little you know, X out. You can like click the auto if you want to listen to it, but you don't have to. This trailer is just always coming at you all the time. So you can kind of get into the trailer at any point because it's already kind yeah. of playing in the background, especially when you're on a website. Yeah, and also with Facebook and and sort of the rise of video on Facebook, the, I think that the research has shown that most people are watching video on Facebook on mute. Mm-hmm. And then you're right, like occasionally you're like, I want to hear what that cat sounds like. Um, but <laughs> Who doesn't? Who doesn't? I think we all do. Um, but so people are creating videos that are not only short form, but that you can just watch that you mm-hmm. don't actually have to have um, any. I guess any we, we, we got no time for listening anymore, right? Too many things to do. Yeah. Pretty soon. What is it just going to have you guys noticed this, too, that it's basically we went from like cave paintings to hieroglyphs to like highly developed language to em- to emojis. Like that's yeah. been the cycle, the circle of yes. life for communication. <laughs> I got no time for that, you know. I can't, I can't even text you a word. Well, I got to text you emoji. Ain't, ain't, ain't got new, no time for language. This was a new Apple <laughs> iOS nine. There's a middle finger emoji now. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's it's it's. Is, we're, isn't we're there changing. a smiling poop emoji oh. too? Oh yeah. Oh. oh well, there's a number of poops. Okay. Oh yeah. You got it. It's all so about, not it's just context, one. So it's all about we context. Had like a million yeah. poop emojis. <laughs> yeah. It's the, it's the next generation in uh, communication. Yeah, poop. All right, on to the next question. We've got Levi Cummings writes, Hey, Collider Crew, loving the change, and I I can't wait for the after show. So ever since I was 10, I've known that I wanted to be a director. Even when I had no idea what exactly a director did, I somehow knew. So my question is this. How exactly do you go through the process of becoming one? Say you go to film college and win a film festival with a feature length. Do studios see it and think, this film was pretty good. We'll give him a shot at a studio-produced one. Or do you still have to somehow climb the ranks? This show has taught me more about the art of film than anything else and has made me appreciate film as a whole. So an answer on this question would be absolutely great. Thanks and keep up the phenomenally great work. Roth? Um, as soon as you figure it out, let me know. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I think there's no one way, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, I will say this, though, the the scenario that you described was a lot more likely uh, 15, 20 years ago in the 90s when there was kind of a heyday of independent filmmakers, although you still see it happen. I mean, Josh Trank made a small movie and then got a big one, and we've seen that happen a few different times, even really recently. Um, But yeah, sometimes people make commercials first. Um, Sometimes they're coming from television. How you get that job is a whole other story. Um, and then sometimes it is independent film. Sometimes it is, there's just, you're an editor or a cinematographer and then they get their first directorial gig or a writer. I'm just listing things at this point. (laughs) So I apologize. It's probably really not helpful. But my point is, um, get on a film set, watch a lot of movies, get on a film set. I went to film school and loved it, but going to film school doesn't mean that you're going to end up being a director. In fact, most people won't. Um, but it's so fun. Like I am in so much debt that it it is just about killing my whole existence. Sorry to get a little personal, (laughs) but I don't regret it. I actually don't because that's how much I loved my film school. That was like the most amazing four years of my life where all I had to do was learn how to make movies and make them. I mean, so my film experience was school experience was different from yours. My film school was a lot of theory, history. I don't regret going to it, but I didn't quite have as much fun as you did because I learned most of the stuff like editing and shooting and all that stuff after I left college. And, and, and But I do agree with you. There's no one way to do it. You can't just go to film school. I mean, that's the thing is, okay, if I were to probably look up everyone that w- I went to film school with, the percentage of people that not just being a director 
are even still in the entertainment industry is very minimal. Same. It's like me and maybe a few other people. Yeah, same. It, because the thing, I guess the one piece of advice I'd give you is, man, you have to be here for the long haul. Mm -hmm. This is a persistent, like this is about persistence and longevity. You got to be here. You can't be like, man, I got to Hollywood. It's been three years. I'm not directing the big budget movie yet. Man, I quit. That's not it. You got to be working like for years. I'm talking like decades. You got to be able to, you know, obviously there's stories of people who just hit the ground running, right? Yeah. But those cases, it's like winning the lottery. Yeah. Very few people do that. Right. Well, same thing for actors. You yeah. know, everybody's every like they were discovered in a part like a donut parlor, like maybe one person out of however many are. I think the statistics for actors are that this is of the people that are in SAG. So that's that's the actors union. Um, maybe two percent are actually working. And then point zero 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 one percent of them are people that you might recognize. And then point zero 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 one percent of them are people that we consider like movie stars. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's not it, like not a, n entertainment isn't easy. Mm -hmm. Any any aspect of it, it, it like you, you there is a level of insanity to it, I think. Right. Like, yeah. don't you think there's just like a level of like, I'm going to do this thing with my life and it's going to suck in a yeah, lot it's of gonna ways. And it's going to suck your life away because you, you're going to be working on it way more hours than a mm. nine to five job is. And then, you know, you sometimes you get rewarded, sometimes you don't. And But you I that sounded so negative because it's also amazing. Yeah. Like I said, I well, don't even regret that debt. I don't I don't regret anything like I I have been more blessed than I could have imagined to be able to to be a part of this industry at all, um, much less in the ways that I have been. And I'm not a director, which mm -hmm. is what I wanted, what I wanted to be too, mm -hmm. um, at the time. But you pick up a camera, start shooting stuff all the time. You can go get a, you can shoot stuff on your iPhone mm -hmm. right now and just do that and edit it on an iMovie of practice. Mm -hmm. Just keep making stuff. That's David. <laughs> now, unlike Ross and Dennis, I didn't go to film school at all, uh, but I, like Ross said, yeah, shoot. I mean, you see people getting deals off their YouTube videos they made off a trailer. You know, I don't know the young man who made that really cool science fiction thing with the monster coming out of the clouds mm. and doesn't he have a deal now or something or they bought the rights to yeah. his movie. I mean, he just made Leviathan. Some, I Leviathan. Think and he, he did that and put it on YouTube and mm. people saw it. Yeah, like, I mean, just take it. You got to take a chance. It's scary and, and risky and a lot of work, but you just have to take a chance. You never know who's going to see it. You don't, yeah. yeah. And then even then, there is an element, like Dennis was saying, for even the people that are working, there is an element of persistence. I mean, even somebody at the level, say, that Josh Trank got to, mm -hmm. he now has to go back, dig in, and get persistent again mm -hmm. and try again because he just fell on his face in front of the whole world. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean that, I'm saying that with compassion. Mm -hmm. That isn't like a dig at this guy. I feel so bad for him. And he's going to have to dig down deep and find that place in him that loves this more than he loves being sane um, and do it again. We always pick, we, you know, obviously we all have fun. We like to pick on people sometimes. Like even, I can't stand most of his movies, but even a guy like Michael Bay. Yeah. I can look at him and be like, man, that's not good. I, I can't do what he does. Mm -mm. I can't show up on set and if, have a $200 million budget in front of me and be like, hey, you need to do all of this and have it done by this deadline. I can't do that and make a profit on all of his movies like he does. I have to respect him in that sense. He does fulfill what the studio asks of him to do. Yeah. Now, I can't do that. I might not have to like it necessarily as a fan or a viewer of movies, but it's hard. That's not easy to do. No, it's not. I mean, <clears throat> but look, things always seem easy until you do them, right? Mm. Like, you know, it's <laughs> right, always exactly. like, I could do that. Like, okay, like, do it. I don't think so either. Like, yeah. I couldn't That's do like that That's like when people watch like, sports. They're like, yeah. oh, my God, I could kick that field goal. How could you get that <laughs> extra <laughs> point? But, I could do that. But making a movie is so <laughs> is hard. hard. Mm -hmm. Like, even, I mean, having just, like I said, this, this tiny experience, I came out of making, when I was in college, like, making my short film, I was in school and stuff too and working. I was working at a production company. But by the end of that six months where I had made it, I had a dread in my hair. Mm. I'm not exaggerating. And the reason was is because I took a shower every day, but I didn't brush my hair because I didn't have time for that. And so at the end of it, I took my hair down and half of it was a dreadlock because I forgot to brush my hair for six <laughs> months. It was clean though. <laughs> I just really want to emphasize that. <laughs> yeah, and then also with digital technology today, things are much much easier. Like you said, yeah. the, the path used to be: you go to film school, you make a short film, you meet people. That's another thing. 
networking is hugely important mm -hmm. in this industry. Um, you meet people, and then after you graduate, then you start off as, let's say, a PA or something like yeah. that, or and you start moving your way up the chain. Yeah. Nowadays, yes, you can still do that. You can still do the film festival circuit, but now that's not the only way. There's other avenues to get there. You yeah. can make your own short films on your own. You can promote... You know, one of the things you can build, a, let's say, a, an audience on YouTube and therefore, yeah. you know, to maybe translate that into something else. So it's it's yeah, it's a there's there are there are multiple paths to to doing this. I want to say too, you were right in terms of the networking thing, like the business, the people that I've seen that I'm most impressed with have these three qualities. Um, they're pragmatic, which means that they can roll with the ups and downs that this industry, even if they're like working, have agents, um, have sold a few scripts so many scripts just sit on shelves oh, and don't yeah. get made. So many projects start and don't stop. Most of them don't get, most projects don't actually go forward. Um, that's for anybody, including like Guillermo del Toro has 20 things in development because he knows only one of them may happen, um, even when you're at that level. And the second thing is like an ability to network and be very charming. Like you meet some of these people in, in person, like Eli Roth, and you're like, well, no wonder you sell every movie. You're like, I would give you my cash right now. <laughs> And talent, you know, I mean, if you have those three things going for you, I think you can be very successful. I feel like I'm really random rambling right now. No, it's good. No. Well, I think I this is a it, subject yeah. matter that we could talk hours about. Yeah. Especially you guys went to school for yeah. it. So, that's, yeah. Well, not just that. I mean, I think it's like, I wish I had that magic for you. <laughs> there is, no, that's the thing. There is no magic formula. There is no like 100% sure way to... No one has the same story. Yeah. No one has the same story. Mm -hmm. And and to your point earlier, David, it is hard to put yourself out there. Even, even in this little tiny format of us mm -hmm. sitting here and talking and putting that on the internet... You're you're putting yourself out there, and sometimes people will do things that make you feel really bad. <laughs> and then you got to wake up and do it again. Yeah. You know? All right. On that note, let's uh, move on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> on that nice note. Yes. Uh, Joe Harris writes, Hey, Collider, big fan of the shows. Keep up the great work. My question is referring to Chris Nolan's final Batman movie, The Dark Knight Rises. It seems as though for a lot of people, it was considered the weakest of the trilogy, even though it's sitting at 88% on Rotten Tomatoes, while Batman Begins is at 85%. Do you guys think the shadow of The Dark Knight played a big role in it being so disappointing? And do you think there were other factors that played into the role in it being so bashed by some fans? Personally, it was actually my favorite of the three. Thank you, guys. And glad everyone's back at Collider. David, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, can I go back to the overrated, uh, underrated? Okay. Sorry, and put that. Maybe put Dark Knight Rises as one of the overrated. I think it was. It's just too long. Yeah, it was long. It was just probably too long. I think. I, I bet you, Christopher Nolan. I don't know what's inside his head. I assume that he thought or planned if he was if he had to do a third one that Heath Ledger would have still been alive. I think he could have used Heath Ledger if Heath Ledger was still around in that movie to make it a little better. I think Bane is a villain, even though Tom Hardy's the man. He did the best he could with that role, minus the voice, you know, whatever we think of that. But I mean, it's just it just didn't come together. And it was just it seemed like it was all over the place. And I was watching it and I was just like, okay, it's got all the pieces of a Christopher Nolan film. It's shot well. Mm -hmm. There's good performances, everything you expect from a Christopher Nolan movie, but it just compared to the first two, I just I don't know how it's so high on Rotten Tomatoes, eighty eight percent. But eighty eight percent, just because it's a positive on a on a you know, positive well, they have a tomato, a mm -hmm. fresh meter. Doesn't mean they gave it a hundred percent. Yes, it just means that the review was favorable, mm -hmm. which means there could have been a lot of weaknesses that we're just not seeing. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. That, that, that's a tough one, Ross. What do you think? What do you think about that? I was <clears> like, <throat> let's look it up on Metacritic. What is it? Like? Metacritic can be <clears throat> kind of a more accurate because right. it <clears throat> actually doesn't it average the the they, actual scores? They give scores mm -hmm. and then they they yeah they take that into account when they get the final score. So mm -hmm. it's instead of a plus what. What David's talking about, which is I always have a, I don't have a problem with Rotten Tomatoes. I think it's great for what it is, as long as you understand what it is. Yeah. And what what it is is a basically a pass fail mm -hmm. like don't like score. So you can have something. That's why you see like Pixar movies, right? Mm -hmm. Why they they're so high on the Rotten Tomatoes score because they're they're good movies. No one's not gonna like them unless your name's like Armand White and you just hate you know life life or anything <laughs> that's like, so. Even if I watch a Pixar movie, maybe it's not my favorite movie of the year. I liked it. Mm -hmm. So plus, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're going to, it's easier to achieve up to 
a hundred percent or ninety whatever if it, you're doing that. Where let's say you make a movie that's dark mm -hmm. and twisted, but a lot of people think maybe is brilliant, but some people think it's stupid. You would get let's say in like a eighty or seventy percent because mm -hmm. you're you're trying to go for something that may turn off some people. So that doesn't mean that that Pixar movie that's ninety three percent, ninety eight percent is a better movie yeah. than that seventy something percent. I think you can't look at it in those metrics as anyway. Yeah. You know, I think you can't like sort of decide the merits of a movie based on a percentage, even if, but, but to your point, if you are going to, you know, or like look at what the critics are actually saying, then Metacritic is more accurate for around what they gave the movie, you know? Mm -hmm. So like if most of them were giving a, it a B, it'll get around a B on, on Metacritics. But if like 90% of people were giving it about a B, it'll show up as a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes, which mm -hmm. looks like a much better score. Um, well, how, does, how does that work? What is a 90% in school? That's an A, a, a minus. minus. A minus. Yeah. A minus. Yeah. So there you go. I was going to say, like, when, also, too, when you're on Rotten Tomatoes, click on the movie or the television show, because I see some of my reviews on there uh, from Screen Rant. Click on the show, and you'll see the individual critics. You'll see Roth Cornett's name up there, and read her review and say, like, oh, she has, a, you know, a positive, a tomato right there. Let's see what her tomato is. And you might see Ross, you know, very detailed review is maybe she might like the first, you know, two thirds of the film, but maybe she didn't like the, the third act. You know, I mean, that's also a thing to check out is not just look at the overall, but maybe just pick a couple critics, you know, that you might want to check out and read those with each review. And then you get a better idea of what they thought about the movie. Yeah. Um, I will say the expectations, I think, do play a big role in our responses mm -hmm. to movies. I mean, I think that. Uh, I liked The Martian, by the way, oh, yeah. um, but I think that we are especially delighted um, with The Martian as critics right now because we haven't been happy with a Ridley Scott movie in a little while. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh my God, he made something I like. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad. Because That's like I Johnny love... Depp and Black Mass. Yeah, no, because it's like, I mean, I love this guy. Like, I love Ridley Scott. He made Alien. He made Blade Runner. I'm so happy that I can like something he made right now, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel like when people went in because The Dark Knight was so great... Yes. People were like, this is going to be even better because it's the next one, which is kind of a crazy <laughs> assu assumption. It's, better, you know? yeah. it's like, just got to get better. That's how this works. Even though we all know that is not how yeah. it works. Actually, usually, usually the opposite. Work. Yeah. There's diminishing third, returns. Third movies usually aren't done that well, don't do as well critically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true. So if we were thinking straight, we would have thought it probably won't be as good. But um, I think that 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 I actually think that people were both harder and easier on the movie yeah. for that yeah, reason. Yeah, I think the fanboys who who love anything that Kristen no Christopher Nolan does were just like, that's it, it's awesome, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, personally for me, The Dark Knight is a better movie. Mm -hmm. But then you have people who are on the opposite side of the spectrum that they were so disappointed in it that like, they gave it a negative score. I still like the movie. Mm -hmm. I still like The Dark yeah. Knight Rises. I just think there's a lot more problems mm -hmm. with it than the Dark Knight or Batman Begins. The Dark Knight to me is the perfect movie in that trilogy. Like mm -hmm. it is an amazing, not just an like, although it's an amazing comic book movie, it's an amazing movie. Yeah. You know, and and his portrayal of the Joker is, is iconic now for a reason. It's not just because he died. No. I think you know, people would still look at that as a beloved performance um, had he not so tragically passed away. All right, on to the next question. We've got Bobby Hask Hoskins writes, with today's advanced technology, what do you think about the idea of Peter Dinklage being made taller through CGI or motion capture to play more roles? They made Chris Evans short and skinny, Brad Pitt short and old, Sam Worthington into an alien, and Andy Serkis into apes. Of course, it would depend on if he even wanted to do this and getting past the whole more representation of little people in movie roles thing. It could be cool to see that even just for one film or series. Thanks a lot and keep doing the great. Keep doing great. Uh, yeah, I think you do run into a problem of representation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I don't think he would do that because he represents a community that is underrepresented in media in general. So like all of a sudden, if you saw him in a movie and he was like tall, unless it played into a story somehow of maybe it's a sci-fi thing. Mm -hmm. It's like he is a little person and then he does some surgery to be tall and how maybe how his life changed and his perspective changed, how people treat him. Mm -hmm. That would work. But if it's just to play a role, I think there would be one. I, I don't think he would do it because I, I think he wouldn't feel good about it. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think the community, his community would not 
like it. I mean, it's it's like, oh, wait, you know, like if I was hypothetically, let's say I was in a movie, it's like, oh, man, let me get CGI and I turn myself white or something mm-hmm. like that. And then see how it, like, that, yeah, that's just not going to work. I don't know. What, how do you guys feel about that? No, I agree. Yeah. I mean, it, I think if 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 that were to even come up in the conversation, mm-hmm. it would raise a very interesting question of why mm-hmm. does this person need to be right like why would you need to make that change in order to portray this character you know what i mean like what is it specifically about that character's life that you need that he would need to do that Mm -hmm. you know what i mean i don't know if that makes any sense like i guess i guess i guess yeah i think what you described is like the scenario where it would make sense to do it there's a reason there's a reason reason for as to oppose he just wants to play in a guy who is of regular height. Right. We just had, you know, Viola Davis give that really powerful speech Mm -hmm. uh, after she won her Emmy for How to Get Away with Murder about black women and women in general about opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's about opportunity. So I think it goes to the same for Peter Dinklage and the whole little people thing is opportunity, not having to change him in any way, but just have a role for him. It doesn't have to be about him being small and all that. It can just be him in a role doing a role like Viola Davis is doing a role in how to go with a murder. And she happens to be a black woman. Like you said, then she's not going to change Viola Davis white. Mm-hmm. So you can have more opportunity. Mm-hmm. You know, we need more Shonda Rhimes, you know, who represents more of the black community and hires a lot of black uh, actors and actresses and have somebody who has a role for, you know, writing a, 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 little, a little person there, like Peter Dinklage, because he's an incredible actor and that's what matters. It's not his size, just mm-hmm. like not the color of your skin or anything. It's just, it's opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's and bu- he's a talented actor. He's great. Yeah, yeah, he's so good. Yeah. Plus, look at that picture right there. Look at that. He's rocking yeah. that. Look at that. He's yeah, rocking rock, rock the hair. Yeah. Man, <laughs> that's awesome. All right, <laughs> on to the last question. We've got Sidhan Mitra writes, you guys are awesome and keep up the Good work. Past two weeks, you guys have been raving about M. Night Shamhammer and Ridley Scott redeeming themselves to an extent to their former glory. My question is, who are the other directors who you think would do great initially but are now in a bad patch and need to redeem themselves fast before losing themselves to obscurity? Mine would be Neil Blomkamp, who was brilliant in the first one, uh, decent in the second, and Shamhammered in his third. Thanks. David? What director do you think is kind of in a bad role right now, in a funk that that needs to redeem themselves? Well, I have to borrow his and Neil Blomkamp just because District 9 wowed me. I, I love was, that movie. I was just in awe when I saw that. I was like, we finally have a young director who loves science fiction and wants to make science fiction films. Spielberg did it when he was younger. You know, He had Close Encounters and E.T. and all that, but Blomkamp was also a writer and director who was doing this. He was in control of it. Peter Jackson was backing him. And he was poised all those great things. And then Elysium came out. And it was, it was like, okay, this is okay. It's not as good. And then Chappie came out. And I'm like, oh, no. And now he's doing the – he's got the Alien franchise. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, I, I was excited talking about original franchises. Yeah. He was the guy I touted as being the next – Creator of great original franchises, and now we'll see what he does with aliens. Hey, hey, hey Chappie was original. Yeah, Chappie was original. <laughs> you know, I am Chappie. I, um, I'm gangster number know. one. Gangsta, gangsta yeah. number one. Yeah, the little human thing. You know? yeah. But uh, <laughs> I, he, he's a guy. He he needs to rebound. He needs a couple, like you said with Shyamalan. Just because this movie's good, he needs one more. Right? He needs at least one more for us to be like, okay, now he's back. I think he needs a couple films, Blomkamp, to get him back to where he was after he did District Nine, which I loved. Hmm. Roth. Who do you think can needs, you, needs can to redeem themselves? Redeem y'all stuff. Um, can you imagine in a world mm. where George Lucas made Ooh. a movie that we all loved? <laughs> can you imagine if he just like went back to his ranch and he's like, I'm bored. Didn't he keep saying he, he like, was going to make these small experimental movies, mm-hmm. but they never actually happened? But happen? they never happened. But what if he did? Because we're, let us, lest, lest we forget. Yeah. Not um, least, but lest. Lest we forget. <laughs> yeah. um, other than Star Wars... He also made. Um, T- Did you see THX? Speaking of like, long time ago, like weird in, experimental. In film school, I, I watched um, American Graffiti. I thought was and American, American Graffiti, graffiti mm-hmm. which is so great. Mm-hmm. Um, and these are no THX is a sci-fi movie right. that's just weird and awesome, and I love it. But t- um, American Graffiti is pretty accessible, and it has. It's just. It's like it. It's the um, dazed and confused of of mm. of that generation, yeah. you know, and it's great. So imagine if he just like went back to his ranch and he's like, okay, I'm not going to think about Star Wars for a while, um, but I'm going to make these. I really am going to make these small story driven movies, um, whether those stories are weird or not. And mm. we loved them. Wouldn't that be exciting? Mm-hmm. 
I well, in, in terms of M. Night Shyamalan, I haven't seen The Visit. I've just heard from other people that it's good or a lot better than his other movies. So I just take their word for it. Uh, with Ridley Scott, I did see The Martian, and I, 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 I think it was fantastic. Um, for me, I would say, and this is, a, this is someone we, we saw this movie together, um, Cameron Crowe. Man. Oh, boy. Mm. He just did Aloha. Oh, One of the worst movies of the year. It's, well, a, it's all kinds of a it's hot mess. such a mess. No, but for real. Yeah. That's what I've heard. I haven't seen it. It, like, doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's just people are saying things. That random, random stuff. Random stuff. Like, nothing connects. <laughs> yeah. So he, you know, before that, I didn't see a, We Bought a Zoo, but he also did Elizabeth Town, which I was not a fan mm-hmm. of either. You know, I loved Almost Famous. I loved Jerry Maguire. Maybe Cameron it's a long Crow. time ago. Yeah, those no, are, a long, are a long time ago. So he needs to, you know, at least for me, I'm like, uh, hopefully he can get it. And it's not like with with Aloha, he had good actors. In, in yeah. there. He had Rachel McAdams, he had John Krasinski, and he had Emma Stone Bradley Stone Coburn, is a half, half Asian. Half Asian. She's yeah. Asian, right? She's got a little Asian there, yeah. yeah. No, I'm just <laughs> She, no. uh, no. as like, it, it's, and, and the, the thing she was about tan. that, no, 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 the thing about it trailer. is that's not even the worst part of the movie. Oh, it's not like that. That's just like a little side note yeah. to the movie. The movie is a, is a mess. That's an asterisk. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like it's it's. We went into it thinking like, oh, we're hearing terrible things about this movie. It'll probably be pretty fun to watch, right? Because you know how sometimes when things are terrible, they're like mm-hmm. almost weirdly fun to watch because you're, I don't know. Yeah. Um. Or, throw, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. I'll just throw, throw. Can I throw another name out there real quick? Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious, has... Wachowskis. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That, yeah. All right. Maybe I shouldn't throw that name out there because that's not as... That's it's not bad. Has has Spielberg made a great movie in a while? Great movie? Yeah. yeah I don't know about... And I don't mean like he's in he's in trouble. Spielberg's... No, 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 no. I'm not trying to say he's in trouble. I'm just saying like... I mean, you have uh, War Horse. You had Lincoln. Uh, I mean, I love Munich. I'm just thinking he hasn't like... He hasn't brought something to the table maybe since Jurassic Park. And was Jurassic Park and Schindler's List in the same year? I want to say around the same, around the same, same, same time, yeah, not the same 93? year. Ninety three, yeah, nineteen ninety four. Once they Schindler's List, she did mm-hmm. Schindler's List and Jurassic Park around the same year. Mm-hmm. That was incredible. But since then, he's delivered. He's very he's, he's a good director, good solid, good but nothing movies. that's been like wow. I, I would like to see something from Spielberg that would really wow me. Ready Player One. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. You never know. You never know. It could be. It could be amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm actually really excited about that. I will say this though that I I actually enjoyed. I know people hated it, and I understand all the problems I have too. But I had fun watching Jupiter Ascending. I, I really too, did. Yeah. It wasn't as bad as I think people were making it yeah. out to be, but it still wasn't good. The, I enjoyed the, it. The biggest problem with Jupiter Ascending, I think, is that it like repeats the same exact action sequence mm-hmm. like <laughs> twice, maybe three times. Like it's literally the same sequence, mm-hmm. maybe three different times. Um, flying on something, drop it, falling off. Yeah, but but even the impetus for why it's happening, like she does this. Thing. Anyway, I won't spoil it for those of you that <laughs> are actually going to watch it, but yeah. it has this weird like Flash Gordon appeal to me mm-hmm. where it's mm-hmm. just kind of like it's it's so it's such over the top sci-fi, but it's beautiful, it's beautiful and it's yeah. kind well, of fun the, to watch. The visuals are fantastic yeah. for it. And I like, um, of course, we his name the, from Theory of Everything. I um, can't remember his name. He's going to be in The Danish oh Girl. Oh, my God. I can't remember his name. Academy Award winner. One best uh, Eddie actor. Redmayne. Eddie Redmayne. How dare I you? I know. How dare I forget Eddie Redmayne's voice. He was so over the top as the villain, but I liked him in it. <laughs> he was so hammy. He hammed it up, but he was. I liked him, though. He, he was He was super hammy in that movie. Oh. Yeah, that he was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I think that's it for this episode of Collider Mailbag. I want to thank the people joining us at the table. Uh, Roth, where can people find you? Um, I am at Roth Cornette on Twitter. I'm on HitFix, and I have a new daily show called Fandemonium, mm. and it looks like this. <laughs> Toys. Uh, David? Uh, you can find me here on Collider on Tuesdays. Uh, starting, I think it's October 6th. Uh, I'm going to see some uh, The Flash uh, recap show. I'm also on Think Hero Pro and on ScreenRant.com and on Twitter at GriffinDE. And you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or on Instagram, Dennis.TZENG. Don't forget, uh, you can send in your questions, uh, collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll answer them either on here on this show, on this weekend show, or the Movie Talk Daily show. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash collidervideos, and we'll see you guys next time.